Max highlights. Coming up on the show. It's an illusion. The Scherzo Agency from France sheds new light on famous buildings. Aerial images. A young German designer and his eye catching carpets. Near and far, the Portuguese Algarve region is a dream destination for tourists from home and abroad. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to Berlin for our highlight show, which begins in the same way as many people begin their day, with milk. Whether it's in coffee or in the form of butter or cheese, it's normally something edible. So if I tell you now that this dress here behind me is made of 30% milk, you probably won't believe me, but it's true. A young designer from Hanover has developed a new process to make a fabric for milk fibre that she uses to make stunning dresses like the ones we're about to see. On the face of it, this is a normal fashion shoot with clothes from a Mademoiselle Chichi collection. The label features unfussy lines from sporty to smart. But these soft, billowing fabrics are made from an unusual substance, milk. Couture from Cow's Milk was the brainchild of Anka Damaska, the fashion label's founder and designer. She realized that there's more to milk than meets the eye. Milk is underrated because people only view it as a foodstuff, but you can make a lot more from it. Milk is a wonderful natural raw material. This is about as exciting as milk products get, and milk certainly has a lot to offer. The special thing about milk fibre is that it has a lovely silky feel. The fabric falls wonderfully and it's cheaper than normal silk, but it's also made of protein so you can wash it normally and it's really very easy to care for. But how is milk turned into fabric? Anna Damaska and her team have developed a special procedure. The main ingredient is a protein derived from sour milk, but they had to do a lot of experimenting to arrive at a final product. We tested it over many years until we came up with the ideal recipe. It's a bit like experimenting with the ingredients you have in your kitchen cupboard. Like baking in a way. The mixture is processed in a lab near the northern German city of Bremen. It's heated up and then pressed through something akin to a mincing machine to create the threads. The milk used is substandard and would otherwise have been thrown out. A fashion designer who came up with a complicated procedure to create an organic fiber. That sounds unusual, but not for Anka Damaska. Up to now, she has successfully divided her time between fashion and science. She learned how to dress make when she was small from her great-grandmother, a milliner. Then, when she was at school, she won a competition for up-and-coming young scientists. After leaving school, she went to Japan and sold t-shirts that she had designed herself in Tokyo. On her return to Germany, she started to study microbiology and set up her fashion label Mademoiselle Chichi on the side. I've always managed this balancing act between science and fashion quite successfully. I went to university by day and then I travelled back to Hanover and managed my firm in the evening and developed my collection. In 2003, she produced her first collection. She presents her designs at fairs and fashion shows in Japan and Europe, such as in Milan in 2010. Her breakthrough came when well-known actresses were seen wearing her clothes. Her US PR agent communicated the good news. 
When she saw it on TV, she was really excited and she rang me up and said, I think that I've just seen your dress on TV. Misha Barton is wearing it. That's a great feeling. I can't describe it. It gave me a real high. Her milk fibre fashion is revolutionary and is going on show this summer. She's already received inquiries from around the world. Anka Damaska has big plans. We see milk fibre as an alternative to cotton. The special thing about it is that we can manufacture it without using any pesticides or chemicals, and it only takes an hour to produce. That's very environmentally friendly. It saves resources. Green fashion with a difference. Regular customer Johanna Bednarek is visiting the showroom in Hanover. She didn't want to wait until the new collection arrived in the shops. The fabric feels really great, almost like silk. In summer it's really nice if the temperature's going up and down. I think I don't perspire as much. The designs cost between 150 and 200 euros. And thanks to the huge demand, Anka Damaska is now planning a milk fiber collection for men. Oh, I think the men will love it. Time now, though, to take a closer look at the illusions created by the Scherzo Agency in Paris. The company's aim is to accentuate a building's beauty by projecting images and lighting effects onto its exterior. They even play around with mystical creatures, making passers-by believe that they are seeing things. Buildings that come to life at night. Illuminated in bright colours telling tales from imaginary worlds. These illusions are the work of creative artists Hélène Richard and Jean-Michel Kahn. They specialize in bathing facades in light. We came to this by way of theatre and film, where we used to work. Being involved with images and the stage inspired us to experiment with light in the open air as well, and light up cities. We want to invite people to see another side of things with the aid of optical illusions. This is found in painting too. It's been around a long time. It's simply a kind of game with the message, look, this is completely different from what you thought. Risha and Khan have been in the business of illumination for more than 20 years. During the summer months, they devote their attention to buildings all over France. For example, this cathedral in Le Mans in western France. Sometimes you walk past a building a hundred times and never even notice its beauty. By means of lighting, you can change it completely, and then you see it with different eyes. The artists spend a lot of their working hours at the computer. Using three-dimensional models, they calculate the surfaces that are to be illuminated. Later, they project their own animated films onto them. A 3D model of a building helps us determine the angles and the precise placement of the images. It also tells us how many projectors we'll need. The Scherzo Agency has already staged more than 50 major projects, illuminating famous buildings in France and abroad including the National Assembly Building in Paris and Jerusalem's Municipal Museum. First, we carry out intensive research on the building in question. And then we try to forget everything again so our imaginations can run wild. The result is something that's closer to fantasy than reality. Our work is shown at night, where facts are of no great importance. The point is to follow your imagination and view things from another angle. The projectors are housed in large containers. 
Risha and Khan program the sequence of images that will be projected onto a building's facade as soon as it gets dark. My dream would be to illuminate Table Mountain in Cape Town, South Africa one day, a gigantic place. It would be fantastic to create images on that huge surface looming above the city. Hélène Richard and Jean-Michel Kahn are two artists whose aim in life is to create fantasy worlds in light, where you can dream with your eyes wide open. Light is also important for our next artist, Sarah Harvey, who first saw her idea transpire when lazing by the swimming pool on holiday. Eight years on and the water is still her daily focus as she uses it to create her award-winning oil paintings. But it's not an easy job as there are several different stages to Sarah's work and the swimming pool itself is just the beginning. <laughs> They convey weightlessness and depict an underwater dance between shadow and light. They're the work of artist Sarah Harvey. Here, she's warming up for a photo shoot. Yes, she's the artist and she's the model as well. The reason why I'm, I'm doing these is to create images which um, allow the figure to be broken up and create interesting abstract images for my paintings, which um, are also very figurative at the same time. Her friend, Rachel Howarth, helps prepare for the shoot here at an old swimming pool in North London. More often than not, Sarah Harvey is the star of her paintings. And even though she's generally reluctant to take a plunge, only she knows which shots she would like to paint back in the studio. So she gives instructions on which takes she wants. I like it when the foot is really big. Later, they'll form the building blocks for her artworks. So when I approach uh, the water, I obviously look at where the sun is and the direction of the sun. I you know, try and get a bit of the reflection into the, into the frame, if I can, um, along with some of the dark sort of contrast too, which makes the uh, figure underwater look even more interesting. The artist has her studio in East London. She starts by placing one photograph over another to create a kind of collage. She learned her trade at the renowned Chelsea School of Art and graduated with an art degree from Newcastle University in 2004. Her technique involves applying several layers of paint and the results are eerily realistic. She recreates the reflections on the surface of the water with a brush dipped in turpentine. But she doesn't want to do a perfect copy of the photos. In each photograph, I'll, um, I'll find something that interests me, that automatically takes my eye to it. And in this case, it would probably be this panel along here with the light and then the dark and then the light against the dark. And I would concentrate on that, this band across here um, and leave the, you know, the rest of the painting very much more gestural. Even she has difficulty defining her style, but describes it as a mix between cubism and realism. She came up with the idea during a trip to Italy eight years ago. Since then, Sarah Harvey's work has featured in exhibitions throughout the world. At an exhibition in Singapore, for example, her paintings sell for up to 14,000 euros. The next painting that I'm starting actually is this one here. I've actually done a few sketches of it already um, and as soon as I saw it I knew it was just, I just had to paint it. I mean, I take thousands and thousands of imagery, images and um, sometimes you just know when you see a good image. When back home, she likes to walk her dog by the lake. 
But even these moments offer no escape from art. They're actually an important part of her work. I don't paint the dog as such, but I paint the water around her in some of the paintings that um, where the where the water isn't quite right in the imagery that I already have. So if I need something specific, I'll try and get uh, capture that here and incorporate that within my paintings, yeah. Sarah Harvey follows her intuition. That's the key to her success and the key to the uncanny clarity of her paintings. Modern technology affects our everyday lives in lots of different ways, and the art and design industry is no exception. German designer David Hanauer found his inspiration from internet satellite pictures of the Earth, and he uses them to create what's known as worldwide carpets. A city street as seen by the human eye. City streets as seen by Google Earth. And the same city streets printed on a rug designed by Munich-based designer David Hanauer. At first glance, it seems more like an abstract pattern than rows of buildings. In the visual sense, our eyes are not really trained to see things from above. We almost always look at our surroundings horizontally. So if you suddenly get this aerial view, it takes time to tell what it's supposed to be. The rug shows part of Las Vegas. Hanawa needed the perfect aerial view of the city. The concept involved was not about the technology as such, but in bringing an old tradition up to date. My aim was to develop a contemporary Persian rug. These rugs are always arranged around a central point, and they're symmetrical. So I mirrored my photos in four directions from the center, and that automatically gives you this Persian look. David Hanauer studies at the Academy of Media Arts and Design in Karlsruhe. His rug was a student project and is now on sale for 400 euros in a designer store in Berlin. The basic concept of the academy is for the students to be relatively free and independent in how they study. If you make full use of it, you can get so much out of your studies, but it demands lots of individual commitment. The more you show that, the more the academy acknowledges your efforts. Before matriculation, David Hanauer trained to be a tailor for the luxury fashion label Escada. But fashion design alone didn't allow him enough room for his creativity. He wanted to explore new horizons. A special project at college was this chair. Or is it a chair? And a table from the same project is more than just a table. In general, I don't believe in creating new forms so much as new functions. The form of this chair, for instance, is reduced to the essentials. Even the seat has been taken away. And that way you get entirely new permutations and applications for the future. His designs are quite often based on rather surprising conceptual ideas. This candle holder made of silicone is called Superflux. Flower vases take the form of tree branches in an imitation of nature. Picture frames designed by David Hanauer are on sale at the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in New York City. It's definitely a good feeling, because it means someone somewhere thought it was good, that this is a product that will sell in the future. But even with a success, you still have to question it. What can you do better the next time? Where do you go from here? The 29-year-old designer's second Google Earth rug is made from views of forests. Hanawa hasn't completed his studies yet, but his projects and the response they've generated are on par with those of established designers. 
Das liegt im Endeffekt, glaube ich, an meinem Alter. My age is a factor here. Since I'm a bit old for a student, I'm doing what I can while I'm still studying to get a foot in the door of the professional world. So I won't have to start from square one after I graduate. I'm trying things out now to see if my works are strong enough for me to work independently and earn a living with them. Oder eben nicht. His latest rug was recently laid out in the lounge area of the International Design Festival in Berlin, on his own initiative. Emerging designer David Hanauer has his sights set high, and he's always prepared to take matters into his own hands. Time now to take a look at the famous Algarve region on the southern Atlantic coast of Portugal. This stretch of coastline is a popular holiday destination, not only for foreign tourists, but for the Portuguese too. Whether it's because of the stunning scenery or the 3,000 hours of sunshine it's recorded to have each year is yet to be determined. So we went along to check it out for ourselves. The Algarve in southern Portugal. Every year, millions of vacationers come here to bathe between rocky coves and in protected bays. Further east towards Spain is the other Algarve. The Rio Formosa National Park, with its dunes and beaches, is like an area of mudflats. Ricardo Barreras takes tourists and nature lovers through the lagoon landscape by boat to Culatra Island. Fishing is the main source of income here. Most of the fishermen live on the island, which can only be reached by boat. This is the Algarve that only a few people know. This here is the other Algarve, the secret Algarve. You can discover things here that you can't see on TV or in brochures. Things are really different here. Tourists are just starting to discover this area. And that includes diving into crystal clear freshwater lakes. Just a few kilometers away from the tourist hotspots is one of the most romantic spots on the island. The Palace of Estoy, a former aristocratic residence, is now a hotel. This is where the hotel room, suites and spa area are located. Many villages inland may have once looked like this. 30 years ago, a private cultural center opened here in Sao Lourenço. It is still unique in the Algarve. Works by well-known artists are exhibited here, alongside those of talented up-and-coming artists from Portugal and other countries. The port town of Tavida in eastern Algarve. There's a fortress from the Moorish era, as well as 32 churches. The area is also nicknamed Little Venice because of the waterfront villas. The water tower provides a unique way to get to know the town in just 15 minutes. When this old water tower was available, uh, I thought it'd be marvellous to use some of my optical equipment to create a camera obscura. Now, this machine is more than 100 years old. Let me just um, get the machine operational. OK. This is a live image. In fact, anything that moves outside, we can see inside. What we have here is the Roman Bridge. Now, it's called the Roman Bridge, but it was, in fact, built in 1657. The Algarve is ideal for golfing enthusiasts. There are no less than 38 golf courses here on Portugal's south coast. Close by, you'll find a number of dream homes. House prices are said to be higher here than anywhere else in Portugal. The former Portuguese soccer star, Luís Figo, is among the celebrities who own a home here. He regularly collects money for his children's charity here in the Algarve. I have a house here, and I'm involved in the hotel business. The most important reason is that the Algarve offers relaxation, tranquility, and good restaurants. That's why I've been spending my vacations here for many years. The Algarve stretches for almost 200 kilometers to the most southwesterly point in Europe, Cap São Vicente, with its lighthouse, a popular tourist attraction. 
Further west is just the Atlantic Ocean and, at some point, the US. On this beach, you'll find the last sausage stand on this side of the Atlantic. A clever entrepreneur from Germany plies his wares here to visitors to the Algarve from near and far. Most of our customers are from Spain. Then we have a lot of visitors from Germany. We also have tourists from Russia and Japan. It's a mixed bag. Looking further north behind the fast food stand, you won't see any overcrowded beaches or hotels here on the Vicentina coast. This area has been under a preservation order for almost a quarter of a century, and it will remain that way so that future generations will also be able to enjoy this very special corner of Portugal. And that's all we have time for. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers.